I'd like to call to order uh, the Joint Senate Environment and Natural Resources Policy and Legacy Finance Committee and the Senate Environment and Natural Resources Finance Committee. Um, welcome, everyone. Welcome, uh, Co-Chair Senator Ingebrigtsen over there. Um, it's very nice to see everybody's faces. Um, and I actually see a few smiles, and that's um, very nice to see these days. So with that, our agenda today, um, we uh, are gonna start this meeting. I uh, will let Senator Ingebretson make an opening statement, then we'll go on to uh, our commissioner Bishop. Uh, she will be allowed up to 15 minutes to uh, give her um, statement, opening statement, and then we'll go to questions. Um, this is an information only hearing. We will be taking no formal votes today and we are not having any testimony today. Um, please stay muted uh, unless you are speaking. Um, and use the hand raise function um, when you would like to um, make a comment. Um, please uh, be respectful today and also give the chair a little leeway because um, uh, I will try to be as uh, good as I can with um, seeing your hands raised, but this is my uh, first actual uh, committee hearing Zoom meeting, so uh, have a little patience uh, today. Um, with that, uh, we're going to be try to be done by 11.30. I think an hour and a half is um, more than enough for us to uh, have a conversation. And so uh, with that, I will turn it over to Senator Ingebrigtsen. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and I think you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Senator Rood, for calling uh, for uh, inviting the uh, Finance Committee along with your Policy Committee to do the uh, evaluation today of Commissioner uh, Bishop. Um, members, I have, I have several questions about the, uh, um, her, Senator Bishop being a representative of the governor. Uh, these questions uh, are some of, some of my constituents and are in a, frankly very concerned about this morning. This morning, it's our hope that we can uh, give, uh, you can give us your ideas along with Governor Walls uh, as to uh, how to manage a large staff and, and at the same time, uh, give us an idea as to uh, how you are going to work with and guide businesses and industry in our state, working with them, them to make us a competitive Midwestern state and of course, keep our environment strong. Again, thank you very much for uh, for being here, uh, uh, Commissioner Bishop. And uh, we'll I guess we'll start out with some comments from yourself. Great. I see you're there now. Uh, uh, welcome, welcome, Commissioner Bishop. Um, I did want to make one comment, and thank you, Senator Ingridson. I did want to make um, uh, one comment. I know there was some issue that um, your this meeting was uh, listed as a performance review, whether some other commissioners were uh, listed as a confirmation hearing. And I just want to uh, make very clear that there was no uh, disrespect intended. It was simply a way of describing the committee hearing because we can't take a formal vote. And so I just wanted to make that clear uh, to everyone. This is a, we're gonna have a good discussion today about what's going forward. And so uh, thank you, Commissioner Bishop, uh, you have the floor. Great, thank you so much. And sorry that it took me some time to get in here. I. We were having trouble with our audio. Uh, the state systems aren't always, uh, it, through the state agencies, aren't always conducive to Zoom. So I apologize for that. I have you on my phone now, which I think is will work just fine. Um, so thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair and Senator Ingebrigtsen, uh, for having me here today. Uh, I look forward to sharing with you the important work that the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency and its employees have been doing to fulfill the mission of the agency, which is to protect and improve our environment and human health. I've been doing a lot of listening, learning and acting uh, in my 20 months on this job. And I'm trying to do the best job that I can for all Minnesotans. Since this hearing is a review of my performance, but also uh, certainly a consideration of my uh, confirmation, I hope to demonstrate to you that 
and working hard and meeting or exceeding expectations by working across our communities to find innovative solutions to our pressing environmental challenges. In an effort to improve both in my role as well as to bring feedback into our processes at the agency, I visit regularly with communities, tribes, and regulated parties. I've heard from Minnesotans across the state that uh, we share a basic expectation, fresh air, clean water, as well as a better climate. For the past 20 months, it's been an honor to serve in this role. As a former leader at a Minnesota Fortune 100 company, I understand the complicated relationship between environmental regulations and economic development. I believe every business desires to do the right thing and protect the environment. I also believe there is no need to choose between environmental stewardship and job creation. We can do both. One size does not fit all when it comes to regulations. And since becoming commissioner, the agency has worked with numerous communities across the state to develop innovative community-centered approaches that protect our waters and foster stronger economic growth. In Laverne, the MPCA worked with the city to develop a site-specific standard for the Rock River. The quality standard protects the river while giving prima, premium Iowa fork which has now changed its name to Premium Minnesota Fork, uh, the flexibility they need to bring in more than 200 jobs to Southwest Minnesota. It's a win-win for the community because they upgraded, as they upgraded their wastewater facility, the company also helped fund the upgrade. They are now considering a $1 million expansion, uh, Premium Minnesota Fork is, that would increase those jobs to 400. In the Minnesota River Basin, the MPCA partnered with the City of Mankato, the Department of Agriculture, uh, and Minnesota State Mankato to host a regional forum with community leaders from throughout the basin, as well as farmers and business leaders to catalyze a renewed commitment to using innovative approaches to improve water quality. By bringing people together and hearing diverse points of view, the MPCA determined that more work was required to better understand the concerns of the communities along the river before developing new water quality standards. For Minnesota farm families, the MPCA worked diligently to ensure their farming operations were minimally impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. The agency continues to publicly recognize farmers for their efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. They are doing a lot of work that should be lauded and the MPCA is working closely with the Minnesota Department of Agriculture to find solutions to support and promote Minnesota's biofuels industry. As commissioner, I take my role seriously with a sense of humility and willingness to take on hard challenges. Immediately upon being named commissioner, I was required to evaluate the polymet uh, permits and water permits. After discussing the 479 page water permit with my staff and reviewing the science that was used on that permit, I am confident in my predecessor's decision to issue the permit, believing that it's protective of our environment. In fact, I defended the agency's work in district court as well as on our recent appeal to the Minnesota Supreme Court. I've also learned that MPCA can do better with transparency and engaging the public. This administration wholeheartedly believes that good policy comes from transparent decision-making and strong community engagement, even during the most complicated times. When COVID hit Minnesota, our communities and businesses were forced to respond to unpredictable challenges, and the MPCA took bold measures providing both flexibility for regulated industries and transparency to the public. The MPCA received over 500 requests so far from permitted parties seeking flexibility during the pandemic. The MPCA responded promptly with a commitment to transparency delivered through an innovative online platform that details each request for regulatory flexibility and our decision to approve or deny that request. Recognized for its work by National Public Radio, the MPCA was the only environmental agency in the nation with that level of transparency. Most importantly, the agency's actions reaffirmed that the public could trust state government to protect our air, water, and land, even during a time of crisis. For me, it was also a learning time for the agency, 
we are looking at how we can institute more flexibility as we move forward. When COVID threatened our work on important permits, MPCA sought an innovative way to protect employees while ensuring the public had meaningful opportunity to provide feedback. With Line 3's permits and the 401 quality certification already in a public comment period, we needed to think quickly and creatively to ensure Minnesotans' voices were heard and the agency received the comments uh, from the public in a timely manner. So MPCA developed three statewide town halls. Some of you were on those town halls, I know. So that we could uh, listen, and these were telephone town halls so that Minnesotans could have their voices heard and that they could hear other Minnesotans and what comments they were putting in. From Roseau to Albert Lee and everywhere in between, more than 1,600 Minnesotans participated in our town halls and more than 400 people submitted live or recorded comments. This was a innovative way that we are seeking to uh, create efficiency, but also that uh, transparency and public engagement on these important permits. Minnesotans expect regulated parties to follow the state's environmental laws. Unfortunately, it's rare, but not all com companies can stay in compliance. And when they don't, the agency needs to take action. So in my first weeks as commissioner, I was required to address serious violations by Water Gremlin. While the MPCA has worked diligently to get Water Gremlin uh, back into compliance, these violations highlighted the need to address a toxic chemical, TCE, which was unregulated. And as you know, uh, that bill passed in this last session, but it wouldn't have happened without cross collaboration with Senator Chamberlain, whom I worked very closely with, Senator Weger, as well as the community groups that were, infected, that were impacted. It also wouldn't have happened, uh, except that this committee took the action to dedicate money uh, in the prior session to help us to work on transitioning facilities out of, uh, out of this chemical. So we really were only working with about 10 to 15 facilities left when the ban went in place. So I think it's a win for Minnesota. We're the first state to enact this TC ban and uh, a win uh, for the businesses in their ability to transition. And I know that Senator Abler can't be here today, but uh, we're really proud of the work that we did on the WDE landfill with all of you. This was something that, uh, this was the governor's second bill signed into law and the people of Andover now can rest easy knowing that that's been cleaned up. Since science guides most of our decisions, 70% of MPCA staff are scientists, chemists, hydrologists, uh, engineers, you name it. Our permitting and regulatory decisions are based on accurate science led us to tackle climate change and improve air quality. And almost two weeks ago, I announced min the Midwest's first electric school bus pilot project that will replace dirty school buses with cleaner buses. In the past 20 months, the MPCA has spent nearly 7.5 million from the Volkswagen settlement to help businesses and schools across Minnesota replace dirty vehicles and reduce greenhouse gases, including Stolt Trucking in Becker and Cleveland Cliffs on the range. We have funded new fast charging stations in numerous communities across the state, including Bemidji, Grand Rapids, Wilmer, and Marshall. This brings me to the governor's priority to reduce greenhouse gases and his direction that the MPCA undertake rulemaking on clean car standards. The same standards that are used in 14 other states, including Maine, Pennsylvania, and Colorado. And since starting the conversation almost one year ago, two more states have initiated clean car standards. I know we'll talk more about that uh, in the Q&A and I look forward to talking and having a dialogue on that. The clean car standards are not Something new or untested, before April 2020, clean car standards on low emissions were the federal government's standards for every lawmaker working to meet low emissions for their new uh, vehicles. Despite the federal government's rollback, many automa automakers, including Ford and Honda, have committed to continuing to use those clean state car standards. Earlier this year, I came to these committees to discuss clean cars. As I said then, and have told many of you, 
Privately, no final decision on clean car standards has been determined. The process to adopt clean car standards is long, and even if approved by an administrative law judge, would not be implemented until car model year 2025. There is an automatic two-year implementation delay that is governed by the Clean Air Act. As with every decision I've outlined today, the MPCA is committed to continued conversations as we work toward a responsible uh, decision for Minnesotans. In closing, I wanna thank members of the committee who have reached out to me over the past 20 months, whether it was touring a sugar beet processing facility, an ethanol plant, a wastewater treatment plant, or any other numerous pieces with uh, meeting with your local elected officials, business owners, and community advocates. I really enjoyed that work and learning more. Uh, I welcome your thoughts, your insights, your counsel, and your feedback, and I'm available for your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I'm just, I have uh, two thoughts before I turn it over to uh, the committee. And um, uh, one of those is I've noticed that you have uh, many letters of support and um, that you have solicited uh, letters of support um, from entities that you regulate. And I find that very troubling. And the letters of support were solicited before we even had this um, committee hearing posted. So I just wanna make the comment that I find that very troubling. I think you put businesses and entities in a very um, untenable position uh, when you when you solicit those letters of support for people that you regulate. So um, going on from there, I'm just going to say we've had the conversation many times and in our uh, personally in my office, we've had it in the committee about not having meetings around the state to inform Minnesotans about the uh, California emissions um, standard that you're going to implement. And those meetings still, we had our, our committee hearing, what, back January, February. Those meetings have not held, have place. None of our folks know that you're still going, you know, full, full board down the, the railroad track with this uh, implementation. And so um, it's troubling to me that, that you haven't had those meetings. We have a group that just held uh, 16 meetings across the state in the last two weeks. Um, they were able to hold those meetings in person. Uh, they did social distancing, masks, they were, everything was done uh, the way uh, up to the governor's standards. And yet uh, the MPCA has not had any meetings um, to inform our citizens about what you were doing. Madam Chair, uh, I'd like to respond to that if that's okay. Yes, Commissioner. Thank you. So uh, Madam Chair, we did have meetings when we, uh, did the notice of intent for rulemaking and we did those around the state as well as held a number of seminars we have not the next stage would be during the proposed rule that we would initiate such outreach uh, throughout the state the mpca really is not back to um, in-person meetings uh, that has not been something that uh, we've been doing as an agency yet we've been doing uh, so larger meetings uh, but we again will look for in person or we'll look for innovative ways that we can do this so again we did a series of meetings throughout the state there was also a study that was done throughout the state to get and solicit feedback before the notice of intent uh, was issued and so the intention here is when the proposed rule would be uh, released that that triggers, of course, the this public uh, engagement and, and public outreach again. And that was our intention was to really get back out there in the communities during that time. Thank you, Commissioner. I think you and I have had the conversation about what throughout the state means because it yeah. hasn't been anyone close to my district at all. I think yeah. the only meeting was like maybe three hours from anywhere in my district. So. Um, I think you and I have had the, many times the conversation about what you consider throughout the state and what I consider throughout the state. So with that, uh, I have many hands raised and I'm going to give it over to Senator Ingebrigtsen. And you know that we would like to get to your area, Senator. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair, for those comments. And, and uh, Commissioner 
uh, Bishop, I'm going to follow up on a question that Senator Rood uh, talked about with regards to soliciting the letters of support. Did you did you solicit those letters of support uh, since the time that uh, uh, the notification went out that we were going to be having this evaluation? Commissioner Bishop. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Ingebrigtsen. So Senator Ingebrigtsen, your staff had contacted my staff on Friday to say that I was coming before this committee for a performance review. It is quite uh, typical that during a performance review, I would ask for feedback from all parties. And most of you, I called you as well to ask for your feedback. I have gotten some positive feedback from parties that we regulate, but also I know that you have received you know, not as favorable of feedback. That is part of the process when you are a commissioner to review commissioner uh, performance. And uh, I appreciate hearing from people that are supportive. And as you know, I appreciate also hearing from people when uh, they are having trouble. Uh, that is my approach to leading this organization is to really listen and hear what people have to say. Thank you, thank you for that. I, and I just need to, need to just make a comment and then go into my first question uh, that that can certainly be intimidating uh, if if somebody doesn't respond uh, to a request like that a, a business or an entity could uh, would feel like uh, well I better do that or, or I might be in trouble and that's that's something I think that 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 uh, people feel uh, that's not totally everybody's feeling but it is certainly mine but with regards to the rulemaking uh, uh, commissioner, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, you know, the authority was given to the governors in the, in the late 60s, I believe. And I'm wondering if, if uh, Governor Walls has considered the, the time factor here uh, from the 1960s to the, to the current time uh, and just how very different they are. Now, giving those commissioners the authority, I understand that. I understand totally that. Uh, uh, if we didn't do that, we'd be at this full time. We'd have to give the commissioner some authority to do that. But this is a huge, huge issue. And when you talk about transparency, I'm just wondering how many Minnesotans has the governor's office contacted about uh, about this huge change of of, uh, of these emissions, vehicle emissions, and, and and mirroring what California standards are going to be. California standards, by the way, uh, is something that we would have to follow if this was. If this was uh, accepted, and, and I might remind you and, and the members that uh, California has 24 million cars and Minnesota has four, four million. There's quite a difference there. Uh, and, and California does not deal with 30, 40 below weather. So um, I'm just wondering if, if the governor has considered, considered allowing the 201 legislators who represent all of Minnesota to, to uh, weigh in on this. And I, I just happen to think that's a that's a good idea. I'd like to hear your comments on that. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Bishop. Thank you, um, Madam Chair and Chair Ingebrigtsen. So what I can say on that is um, that certainly the statute as it stands uh, does allow for the commissioner to regulate uh, greenhouse gases from uh, transportation sources. So. Mm -hmm. That has been in statute. What I can say about this is, you know, the governor has looked at how 14 other states have done this, uh, which is all through rulemaking. Uh, some states had executive orders to do it. Some states, uh, a few states, I think two, were directed by the legislature to do it, but all were done through the rulemaking process. I would also say that, you know, almost half the cars sold in Minnesota now meet that state standard. So this isn't a um, issue about uh, the standard as much as what you have said is, do people know about this? I am getting letters every day asking me to move forward on this. Does that gauge where we are? Uh, no, because of course you are likely getting letters that say don't move forward on this. I think the important part of this is that uh, in 20, 2007, the legislature also put in statute a goal through the Next Generation Energy Act to reduce carbon emissions by 80% by 2050. That 
is uh, we are not on track for that. And I think that uh, we have to look as a state at innovative ways to accomplish that goal. And this, frankly, is when 14 other states are doing it, it is something that we will look at when we know that transportation is the biggest emitter of greenhouse gases in our state. So that is what we are looking at. There is time for comment and input in this process. And again, we have not uh, put forward a rulemaking at this point. We've, we're having a discussion about it and I appreciate the opportunity to discuss it now. I do not have a number of how many Minnesotans that uh, we have touched base with. We've had the seminars, we've had uh, discussions and webinars, and we've had meetings throughout the state, one in Fergus Falls and one in Virginia as well. Uh, so not in, not all over the state, of course, and not in Brainerd, <laughs> Senator Root, I'm sorry, or Baxter, but uh, certainly we uh, intend to do more of that outreach uh, before anything would be implemented. Senator Ingebretson. Uh, no, I'm going to let somebody else uh, go ahead. We got a lot of hands up here, Senator, uh, and and uh, thank you for that. I I just I just can't emphasize enough that that uh, yeah, again, the legislature should be playing a bigger role in the decision making on something that is so so uh, potentially very big when it comes to to business, uh, especially being now the outlier, if you will, the only state in the Midwest. Is forward and create some problems and I think some of the other senators might as the, the ones that live on the borders may, may come up with those questions on, on what they're going to be challenged with so um, thank you. Thank you Senator Ingebretson. The next hand up is Senator Mark Johnson. Hey good morning Commissioner. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Appreciate the opportunity to discuss a couple of things. One of the things uh, up in my neck of the woods here in Northwest Minnesota, of course, is Enbridge Line 3 replacement. It, it's something that's very critical uh, to our economy and it, quite frankly, to our environment and safety up here. We're dealing, as you know, with a 50 year old pipe uh, and it, it's time to be replaced. Uh, $2.6 billion replacement cost uh, that that offers a lot of good jobs up here and a lot of uh, a, a lot of economic benefit with 35 million dollars of increased taxes uh, for our communities and school districts and counties. So my question is early on this year with the 401 uh, certification, it sounded like August 15th was going to be the date. There was a lot of security around the work that the MPCA had done. Uh, it's due diligence in being able to issue that, uh, that certification. However, after a couple of comments were made um, and requests for uh, a hearing that was granted, which pushes that the permitting or the certification back to November. I'm uh, just wondering what had happened in that time frame and why uh, the MPCA decided it was time to go back and revisit that certification. Great. Commissioner Bishop. Madam Chair and Senator Johnson, thank you for that question. So what I can tell you on that is um, we did have 36 letters requesting a contested case hearing. I think it was 36 or 34. But again, uh, numerous parties that requested a contested case hearing. Of course, we had thousands of comments uh, on the 401 as well. The When we issued when we put out the 401 for comment, uh, we did say at that point that Enbridge had you know, met the various requirements. Um, when uh, the comments came in and we assessed those and looked at those, as well as understanding that there is a ruling in the Court of Appeals that says if there is any findings of fact or, um, that are raised and new evidence is raised that you should grant a contested case hearing, uh, that is what's guiding us right now. We both uh, believe that uh, there was legitimate questions about some of the water crossings um, and stream crossings that needed to be looked at. And so the contested case hearing, which is actually starting today, right in our conference room uh, virtually now, uh, is scheduled and uh, that is what they are hearing. So we continue to move forward. As you know, there is a 
deadline of November 14th. So while uh, I know the company had looked at August, um, that is not something that we could do given the request for the contested case hearing and the current ruling by the Court of Appeals. So we are expecting that the administrative law judge will uh, issue a report by, uh, I think it's mid-September, um, so that we can evaluate that and incorporate any further comments into the 401 before such uh, could be issued. Senator Johnson. Yeah, so, so that, that brings up an, more questions. And so when at one point you feel very confident about the report, and then the next, uh, you know, we get some, some pushback. I mean, these are things that should have been foreseeable. Mm -hmm. um, do you just, the staff not do their job in preparing the original 401 certification? So, Senator Bishop. Bruder, Bishop. Yeah, and Senator Johnson, no, I don't believe that. This is a very complicated uh, 401 and one of the largest and most scrutinized projects in the state. It has to be thorough. We have to follow the process. And that is what we are doing. It's the complexity of the different wetlands and stream crossings um, really guide this. And so we need to make certain, and uh, the company understands this as well, that we need to make certain that it is protective of water of the waters, and that's what we're doing. Senator Johnson. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioner. And, and I don't want to belabor it. I know there's a number of hands up. So I just want to make two points here. Uh, number one, this is a very complex project, and that's why it's been under study for over five years, and I understand that. The second thing I want to say is that ever since I've got into the legislature, I've, I've heard about process, 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 yet this is one of the most studied projects and one of the most delayed projects next to PolyMet that we have in the state. So I don't want this to be the process killing the project that we saw maybe down in True Shrimp or other areas as well. So. I just want to make sure that that this is not something that the governor a uh, ploy that the governor has or the agency in delaying this. So I appreciate your candid responses. And I just want you to know the concerns uh, for the future of this project. Thank you. You're on mute, Senator Rudy. Ah, uh, there we go. Uh, the next, uh, the next hand up was Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning. Um, just want to comment on a couple of points you made, and um, you made a reference to the usage of good science. Uh, early last year, I, uh, I took the opportunity in committee to take the agency to task because they had ignored a scientific report out of the University of Minnesota for over nine years, which was critical of the way the agency handled specific conductance, uh, which led to the problems with shrimp and other issues, other industries in Laverne. Um, I thank you. The next day, uh, you were not at that hearing, but the next day you came in and visited me in my office. and. Uh, at that point, I mentioned to you that I did not hold you responsible for the mess that you inherited coming in as the new commissioner, but that I would hold you responsible for cleaning it up. So today, what can you tell me that you've done in order to clean up the agency? Yeah. Commissioner uh, Bishop. Thank you, uh, Chair Rood and Senator Weber. Thank you for that question. Uh, I do think that uh, with that, uh, we're very close on um, addressing the issue of specific conductance. And I think uh, your mayor would talk about this and certainly um, we're seeing improvements uh, in that uh, area. Um, and as you know, I mean, with the premium Minnesota pork that uh, and addressing this with this site specific permit uh, is part of what we're doing to uh, innovate in a way that uh, we haven't always innovated. So I would say that from uh, the agency and letting science guide, uh, the when we're going into these communities and doing 
very specific permits, and we did one in Avon, Avon as well on fluoride, um, or sitting down with all the parties at the Minnesota River, and that included our agriculture committee, our, our agriculture um, partners, as well as uh, all of the city leaders and along the basin. That is innovative, and that is something that uh, we are very committed to. We have a priority here about listening and engagement, and that's uh, something that I do think is improved. And I will also say that the piece, and I hope that there is some credit here because we were on calls with you regularly during COVID with members of this committee um, during COVID about the flexibility requests that were coming in from regulated parties. We acted on those in a way that uh, the agency, one, did not need to, nor under the laws, nor did had we ever faced something like that before. Our, our regulated parties want to do the right thing. We need to trust that and verify uh, that they are. And I think that the, that that continues to improve in those relationships with our regulated parties. Thank you. Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, in relationship to, in relation to that comment you just made, um, you know, about roughly a month ago, I was contacted one day by one of the ethanol plants in my district. Um, they were having problems with the main boiler in their plant. And so they had requested a temporary permit to um, put in temporary boilers so that if the main boiler went down, they could continue operations. Uh, they were told point blank that the agency was no longer considered temporary permits. Uh, so I was contacted. I made a phone call to uh, your government affairs person. Um, and in all fairness, she, did not un she didn't know anything about the issue, but proceeded to, um, this was about 11 o'clock in the morning. And about 1.15 in the afternoon, uh, I got a e contact from my ethanol plant that they'd been given their temporary permits. Now, I appreciate the fact that they got them, but um, I guess, and I don't mind going to bat for my constituents, but I guess I need to ask you the question, why should a le elected official need to make the phone call? Commissioner Bishop. Uh, Senator, Chair Rood and Senator Weber, you know what, I don't know. And possibly that was already in the queue for consideration on regulatory flexibility, but I don't know the specifics on that. I'm happy that uh, they ended up being pleased, but I, I, I don't have a, a record that it was because of your call. Certainly uh, your call may uh, have some to bring it to our attention, but I don't have any record that that was proved because of your call, but I'm glad that the regulated party in the end was happy. Senator Weber. Well, thank you, Madam uh, Chair. You perhaps. Perhaps. Uh, state government agencies in particular, um, you know, approach everything from a one size fits all situation. And I'd like to bring up in that discussion the proposed changes in the manure management uh, uh, area that um, the, I think the public comment period closed sometime the latter part of, of July. And, um, and I did make, I did make comment uh, regarding that issue, but there again, uh, I think that the proposed rules uh, reflect a real lack of knowledge of what happens out in the real world concerning uh, livestock production. And, uh, and I actually made the statement that, that um, um, in there that it, indeed the one size fits all and it prohibits, uh, prohibits the uh, distribution of snow manure mix in February and March. Well. You know, February and March uh, between northern and southern Minnesota, they, we can have entirely different weather going on. And so to come up with rules that apply to everybody during that period of time are, is not really a, a practical situation. And 
And I realize that the final rules are not proposed yet, uh, but I do hope that, quite frankly, the agency does a better job of, uh, of considering the fact that this one size fits all has to stop in Minnesota because you create more problems than you solve. Commissioner Bishop. Thank you, Senator Weber. Uh, I did read your comment letter this morning, actually. Um, so I know that uh, you had submitted comments and I saw the comments uh, from other uh, interested stakeholders as well. Um, the MPDS general permit right now for feedlots expires uh, January 31st, 2021. So that is why we are looking at this and considering this. Uh, but it's at this point, it's uh, in we're evaluating all the comments before any action would be taken. Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just one last point. Um, I, uh, I visited with the commissioner about this last Friday when she called and and I also believe that uh, soliciting letters of support from people that you regulate really puts many entities, whether it's private business, public entities, um, in a difficult position and an awkward position. And, and I really don't think that's fair to them. And uh, they begin to feel that they're damned if they do and damned if they don't, regardless of how polite and non-threatening the request might be. And, uh, and I think that uh, to have done so I, I was, was not uh, done in the best judgment. And that's my final comment, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, I believe the next hand up is uh, Senator Sendum. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and uh, welcome commissioner to our uh, to our hearing. Uh, it's good to see you. Uh, I, I'm going to stay off the uh, kind of the issues and just try to probe a little bit in terms of, uh, of who, who you are and how, how you think. And uh, am I coming through okay uh, on the voice? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, so commissioner, uh, you mentioned in your testimony that, uh, and you didn't give a name and I won't either, but did, uh, you were a product of a, of a Fortune 500 company in Minnesota. And, uh, and I in particular think that's good that uh, somebody comes out of the private sector into state government. Uh, they've got a life experience within a, a, a corporate setting and uh, what it probably is like to be regulated. And now they go into the, into the uh, regulated environment yourself from the standpoint of, uh, of moving that environment forward. But uh, just thinking about where you came from, Commissioner, uh, and you mentioned the uh, the mission uh, values, et cetera, of the pollution control agency, something along the lines of protecting and, and preserving the environment and human health or something along those lines. What, what were the, uh, or what, if, if in fact there was one, what uh, that, that came out of the company that you, uh, uh, that you came from? Uh, did they have a particular operating philosophy relative to their how they approach their business? Yeah, Commissioner Bishop. Thank you, Commissioner. Or thank you, Chair Rood and Senator Sendum for that question. Um, yes, I mean, I came from a very values-based company, um, one that put customers at the forefront, uh, as well as the communities where they operated. I'd say the values, and it's interesting because I cite them in my head a lot because they were so ingrained in every performance review as well as uh, throughout the building. But one of them was learn from challenge and change. And certainly I knew, and I apply that every day, that uh, I came into this job knowing that it would be a challenge and that things would change. And what you take away from that and learn from that is something that, uh, and how I approach this job every day. Another value was have respect, humility, and integrity. Uh, that was in the corporate environment, and certainly that is one that I take to this role as commissioner. Um, and that respect factor, I think, is really important in working with all of you. Um, I respect your roles uh, as senators and representatives for your districts, as well as that statewide view that you must apply to your decisions. And uh, I hope as well that you'll 
continue to respect my role, which is to oversee this agency and as both an appointment of the governor, but also uh, subject to your confirmation. But I lead every um, decision with that uh, grounded in that respect as well as humility and hope that I bring that to our regulatory decision making as well. Uh, thank Senator you, Commissioner. Senator. Thank you, Commissioner. And uh, you sort of got to my second follow up question uh, that you do strive to bring uh, those values to, to state government. Uh, I was going to ask whether or not uh, the culture of state government, uh, at least in, in particular your agency, was such that, uh, that that was not possible to crap to bring some of those values into it. But I think that you uh, at least cited that. Uh, you've carried those values forward. So Commissioner, if you look at the agency and as you drive to work every day, uh, probably not now with COVID, but as you might envision driving to work every day and what you think about uh, pollution control agency, your work, uh, is it, uh, as you come to work every day, is it, is it something along the lines of, uh, of implementing uh, state law? Is it uh, advocacy? Is it enforcement? What do you perceive your role as commissioner to be uh, primarily? Commissioner Bishop. Madam Chair and Senator Sengem, thank you for that question. Really, um, I see myself as um, strategy and, uh, and regulator. So certainly we have a large um, contingency of what we do is uh, regulation, but I also as, um, see it as how I can be the strategic leader that brings both uh, the vision uh, and the mission to life for this organization. I'm also, and not, you know, 70% of our agency of scientists, we're not asking them to get involved in the policy, but I see my role as uh, also policy and working with all of you to implement policy. Um, we like to keep our state agency um, workforce primarily focused on the work that they're doing and not, um, and you can certainly interact with all of them and we bring them to meetings if they're working on a certain issue or project that is important to you, um, we will bring them forward. But really that intersection of strategy, policy, and regulator is where I see my uh, overarching role. Senator Sengem. Uh, thank you for that, and I've just got a couple more, and we can you can you can answer them quickly, uh, Commissioner. Uh, I'm not uh, not beholding to a long answer, but uh, I just want to get to this. Uh, you're obviously appointed by the governor. Uh, the governor, if you will, is your if your boss. Uh, mm -hmm. Through the Constitution, we have the confirmation process. Uh, to some extent, uh, the Senate's your boss. The legislature's. Your boss. How how do you how do you look at that? How do you look at your relationship with the legislature? Through the Senate, which has to, uh, uh, at least, at least is uh, is not necessarily obligated, but uh, certainly has the opportunity through the Constitution uh, to address your confirmation. What do you think that relationship ought to be between a commissioner and the legislature? Commissioner Bishop, Madam Chair, and Senator Sengem, uh, I believe that it should be a, a constant dialogue. I believe that you should have uh, a review of my performance as commissioner. You do have hold that um, ability uh, for the confirmation process. I respect that. And importantly, you also hold uh, the oversight for our budget. Um, I think that's a, also a very important piece. So maintaining good relationships with every member of the Senate is important, and especially uh, these two committees. That is something that I've worked with uh, and tried to do with all of you. I respect where I respect your roles and uh, hope that uh, you'll continue to respect that. But uh, ultimately I implement policy of the governor, um, but uh, importantly, there is uh, other aspects of our uh, areas of the MPCA where it isn't policy. It's really the day-to-day -day work on permits. There's 18,000 permits here at the MPCA. MPCA that we're working on. Uh, I've lost her. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. So with that, I am um, certainly see the legislature as a critical partner. I will also say, you know, coming from the corporate world, I 
always worked with members on both sides of the aisle. Um, I started government affairs at the government affairs division at Best Buy when I was there. So working with our uh, legislatures throughout all of uh, the United States, but especially in your hometown state, uh, was really important. And before that, I worked for Governor Ventura. I don't come to this with the political bent as much as I come to this discussion uh, trying to do the best job that I can and to come to reasonable decisions that are in the best interests of Minnesota. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Senator Sendum, if you could maybe do one more. We do have a lot of hands up here. A quick one. Uh, uh, Commissioner, uh, what uh, uh, each year the agency, or at least every other year or so, the agency brings forth uh, uh, re recommendations for legislation. Uh, and uh, of course, each year uh, on a continued basis, you do rulemaking. How do you, Commissioner, decide whether or not a particular issue should be addressed through legislation or through rulemaking? What process? Sure. Uh, so, uh, Chair Rood and Senator Senjum, you know, we look at those uh, what's an existing rule and what needs to be updated. We have a kind of priority list of what goes forward. And then, certainly, uh, if it's a new rule, which isn't uh, all that common uh, in the agency, but if it is a brand new rule, then we would look at across. Um, other states on how that's been implemented, if it has been implemented through rule or through legislation. So um, those are some of the pieces that we look at. And we also know that rulemaking has a very public component to it. So um, when we go into a notice of intent, uh, that is to be able to talk about uh, that a draft rule could be uh, put into place. Um, and then we go into a proposed rulemaking as well as um, before the final rule, which uh, again has to be approved by a administrative law judge. So it's a pretty thorough process. Um, but as you see, there are some things that uh, make sense to do rulemaking and there may be some items and we certainly work on a lot of good policy together. And we saw that on the TC, that wasn't something we were going to do through rulemaking. We did that through legislation um, when we look at uh, such items as that. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to work together and I value that. Uh, thank you, Commissioner, and thank you, Madam Chair and members for your patience. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next uh, hand raised is uh, Senator Matthews. Madam Chair. Yes, Senator Eaton. Um, we've been doing this for about an hour now and you've not allowed a single Democratic Senator to speak. Um, 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 Senator Eaton, if you will look at the participant board, you will see that as the hands are raised, they are in order. And so if you look there, the next senator will be Senator Dibble, Senator Herr, Senator Bigham. And so uh, I am taking the hands, the senators, in the order that they raised their hands. And so I do believe the next three or four or five will be um, the DFL senators. Um, and so we... Um, we are bearing, being um, very, I, I, that's how it works. That's how the Zoom works. So, and I thank you for your comment because um, I, I can see where it was uh, concerning, but we take them in the order the hands are raised. Thank you. Senator Matthews. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Bishop. Um, I am getting, my computer keeps popping up notes that my internet connection is a little choppy so bear with me if i am cutting out or let me know if uh, if i'm missing something but i'll get through this as best i can uh, rural minnesota just happens some days out here um, i want to speak quickly i know others have brought up the uh, california rulemaking standards and uh, commissioner you know that i carried a bill that actually should not have been uh, an issue in the first place uh, unfortunately, it was, um, but the uh, the agency came out with their decision that they were going to pursue this by rulemaking. It was met with lots and lots of resistance from around the state, and uh, the bill that uh, I carried went through four committee hearings, and we had basically the same story uh, repeated by the agency uh, that they believed they're following state law. And, every, and even though I kept repeating it every uh, committee hearing, 
that that was not the case. That first of all, you have to play a big game of mental twister to get from what the statute says about uh, adopting standards of air quality to all the way as far as the new regulations are purporting to control what dealers can sell on their lots and, uh, and the vehicles that we have around. And uh, so the, the bill came forward that uh, was just going to explicitly state uh, that it's now not allowed uh, to adopt rulemaking in these areas. Um, and so I, I uh, am frustrated that there's the uh, continued uh, uh, discussion that the agency believes they are following the law uh, when they're clearly not, uh, even from what the statute currently says. And so we went through the hearings with that, um, and the agency has continued to hold on to their position and uh, did not back down uh, whatsoever, even though that we offered to, uh, can we institute a four-year delay uh, all the way to we wanted to just have a two-year delay. Uh, and the agency would not budge on that uh, whatsoever. And that was uh, really disappointing. Um, so I know we've, we've talked about that uh, this last session. We'll likely be talking about it next session. Uh, but I do want to hit uh, an area locally um, with uh, the city of Becker and Northern Metals. And until last week, I believe that the Pollution Control Agency has treated uh, Becker and the Northern Metals Company atrociously. And uh, I was glad to hear, uh, I'll state, I, I w was told that you did go out there and visit with the folks last week uh, at the Becker facility. Uh, it was a positive meeting. I got uh, positive feedback afterwards. Uh, and I'm glad that apparently uh, after this hearing was scheduled either that day or later the next day was when they got the phone call out there that you wanted to go out there and meet with the folks at Becker. Um, but I'm, I've been sorely hoping and wishing that the agency's attitude that was evident last week would have been the way that the agency treated this company in this situation the last two years. Uh, and that simply has not been the case. Um, going back to last year, there was the uh, well, the uh, Northern Metals broke ground on their facility two years ago. Uh, you took over in January of 2019. There was work throughout the spring and summer on trying to meet deadlines for getting the new facility and the site up and running as they were transitioning from Minneapolis to Becker. And uh, they needed uh, some extensions to the projects, as you'll recall back then. Uh, your agency denied those requests and uh, ended up going to court multiple times over that. And the agency lost in court uh, every time because the, the judge ruled in their favor about the extensions as they were going forward. Uh, we had the, the whistleblower situation that you uh, told me about that we had conversations on. Uh, you're aware that was one person in the company that was uh, not acting correctly, that was breaking the law. Uh, the company leaders uh, did not become aware of it until that time. And when they did, they admitted it was wrong and they, they rectified that situation. But that was used then for the uh, consent decree uh, that both parties agreed to, uh, to shut the Minneapolis site immediately and uh, left them in limbo as, the, as they tried to complete the transition to Becker. Um, and then we had the uh, Becker fire that came out uh, back in February and the actions and statements from Governor Walls and from the agencies uh, were extremely negative and were very condescending towards the company making assumptions that perhaps they were at fault again when that was clearly not true and not able to be proven. Uh, and came in with the, as they were just about ready to open and be able to operate the new facility, uh, they were told to stop again for at least another 30 days. I don't recall the exact time frame uh, in all of that. Uh, but when there was clearly room to be working together with the company in what could be a mutually beneficial relationship, there clearly has not been. And uh, so we had, I, I got a little bit of update on your meeting that you had uh, last week with uh, with the folks in Becker, with the company leaders. 
uh, they were glad to uh, have that positive uh, meeting and seem like maybe we can get this finally behind us and move forward in a positive relationship. But this has been very, very disappointing. And we've talked about this uh, privately multiple times over the months, Commissioner, uh, and agencies persisted in the way that they have uh, operated towards Northern Metals, and it's just not been right. And I wanna ask if, uh, if I can expect that the way that they work to, that you worked together last week is what I can expect moving forward. Uh, if we're going to uh, continue to have uh, unnecessary roadblocks as this company building a state-of-the-art facility, which is getting national and international recognition is opening and moving forward. Uh, and if I can expect better from your agency than I've seen in the track record of the last couple of years. Commissioner Bishop. Chairman Rood and Senator Matthews. Uh, yes, I did visit to Northern Metals uh, last week and we've had a standing invitation. Uh, Scott Helberg, the uh, president of that uh, facility has uh, invited me out there and we've had a standing invitation. As you know, that was my second visit out to the facility. Uh, you're right, the, it is a state-of-the-art facility. What I will say is that, um, as you know, we need to hold our regulated parties accountable. And so uh, I don't want to go into the whole history, but there are a lot of different uh, pieces that uh, in your characterization of working with this regulated party uh, that just are not... Um, the way that uh, we would expect a regulatory regulated party to act. Uh, in the consent decree, they admitted to eight different uh, pieces of, uh, this wasn't just a whistleblower, it was eight different accounts that they admitted to where they were falsifying the uh, air logs and records at their Northern Minneapolis facility. That was in that September period. And when that was brought to, to bear, they shut down. That was part of the consent decree that they shut down that facility in Northern Meadows. We wanted to get the move to Becker knowing this facility was state of the art. Uh, it was unfortunate that uh, they had so much debris uh, on that lot that they that there was a fire that was out of control for a week. When we uh, asked them not to shred, I don't believe that was unreasonable by the department at all, because the fire was still going when we asked them to stop their shredder and not uh, apply the shredder to any of the material of the burned cars or any other things on their lot until we understood what was in the water, what was in the debris, are they handling the fire um, blocks correctly? And so that was not, in my view, unreasonable. When I went out to Northern Meadows, that is clearly almost cleared up. They have addressed the ponds and all the sediment and runoff in those ponds, uh, which uh, is still being addressed, but they are on track to comply. And what I will say is that facility, when they are shredding, is very clean. And I'm very proud of where they've come and what they can contribute to that city of Becker and uh, the whole region. I mean, they're taking scrap from all over the region. There's not a smell, not a noise. Um, and the filtration system they have is incredible. They're also on track to um, be carbon neutral by 2030, um, which is remarkable. I talked to them about uh, looking at the VW grants for some of their heavy equipment because they wanna to move to maybe one of their cranes to be electric. That's a costly process, but that's the kind of discussion that we're having. Uh, I will visit with any regulated party, even if they had a consent decree or there was something that uh, went wrong uh, in the past, I expect and I know that they wanna do the right thing now. And uh, that I think we're on that path to do that. I think you would have seen it too with Water Gremlin, when things go wrong, we don't just get there and beat up on the things that go wrong. We look at ways to get that facility back into compliance and uh, wanting to ensure the safety of our air and the water. 
I will also say that we partnered with the city of Becker. When they asked for air monitors, we brought out air monitors uh, when that fire was going because the citizens of Becker were contacting me, were contacting the governor about the air quality. And I don't think you'll see um, con statements that I was, um, I'm not sure how you said, that were condescending toward Northern Metals during that time. I was concerned, you were concerned, the city was concerned, and rightfully so when that fire was happening. I think we're on a good track and that's my intention is to continue to be on a good track with that facility. Senator Matthews. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. And unfortunately, yes, we do have uh, differing records of what the facts are. Um, and uh, in there, there, we've had conversations. I, I called you at one point taking issue with how a press statement came out at one point that was uh, worded uh, with very inflammatory words, in my opinion. And I do think you changed your tone afterwards in media interviews that you had following up on that. Um, but there, there was not this, not this kind of collaboration uh, all the way along with the transition with the, when basically all the parties in the city of Becker thought after the fire, at the very least, we could get the unburnt materials started to go through the shredder and get that out of the way so that it's not uh, sitting there being a hazardous condition. It took, I believe over a month, took multiple weeks uh, before we were able to get uh, that approval from the commission in order to do so. And uh, uh, the, the city of Becker and the company leaders want this relationship to be a lot better moving forward than it's been in the past. And uh, when you first took uh, over the agency and you came and met me with my office, I was encouraged uh, that you had a business background. I was hoping that was going to indicate uh, a, a change in direction that we'd seen from the previous administration and the way that their agency handled uh, these regulated parties like this. Um, and I'm hoping that we can change and get back to that place now that uh, that is more helpful uh, to these businesses, to our local governments, to these regulated entities, uh, because it, in Becker's case especially, that's not been the case so far. And uh, I'll continue to advocate for my district. Uh, I want to thank you for uh, the work that you've done in there. I want to thank you for coming out and visiting last week. Uh, I did ask Governor Walls uh, to come out immediately after the fire when he made some very negative statements about it. Uh, I tried contacting his staff right away and said, Governor Walls does not have the correct information about the whole situation around this new facility, would you please find a time for him to come out and meet with these folks? There's a standing invitation uh, to the governor like there's been to you. Uh, and the governor came back basically saying, no, not a, we'll have to get to it or our schedule's busy right now. Uh, they just told me it wasn't gonna work out and they were not going to plan to come up. And uh, that's disappointing to me. I think that needs to change. Um, if there's a way that we can help get that worked out, I would love to help with that. Uh, but uh, I, I wanna uh, mm -hmm. thank you for being here today. And I want to uh, see the agency do better towards our business and regulated parties. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Madam Madam Chair, one follow up to Senator sure, Matthews. Sure. Uh, Senator Matthews, I did, after I went out there and saw where they are at uh, with their facility, I did raise this back with the governor's office. Um, their sustainability goals are laudable. And the fact that they are on track to be carbon neutral um, by 2030, as well as operating on renewable energy is something that is really interesting to us and uh, to the governor. And so I did raise this as um, a possibility that um, as they're, you know, they're almost done cleaning up the debris from the fire. And those last pieces are really troubling. I know they're, Scott told me they're about 18,000 pounds, some of the 
some of the debris of all the metal that melted together, but it is something that I've raised as well with uh, wanting for the governor to see uh, how far they've come. And it's a really incredible facility. So thank you for raising that. Excellent. Glad Good to commissioner. hear that. Thank uh, you. Next hand raised was uh, Senator Dibble. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, uh, Madam Chair, uh, what, what time are we scheduled to adjourn? Sorry, we'd like to get done at 11.30 if possible. Oh, thank you. Um, well, I, I think it may not be possible because I think a number of other DFLers would like to make some statements and ask questions. So if we could please allow everyone who would like to say something in this forum be allowed to do so, I'd be most appreciative. Well, and Senator Dibble, I do have the list of hands that have been raised. Great. Are you going to commit to letting every DFLer who wants to speak, speak? Senator, I think that every senator, regardless of whether they're DFL or GOP, should be allowed to speak. I, uh, this is a bipartisan committee. I think we've had a very good uh, conversation today. And so uh, the people that raise their hand should be allowed to speak, regardless of what party they're in. Great, thank you, I appreciate that very much. Um, uh, Madam Chair, I just wanted to make an observation on the last uh, exchange um, uh, in which uh, I heard Senator Matthews uh, defending Northern Metals, and I'm um, glad that Northern Metals uh, appears on track to be building a state-of-the-art facility that's gonna have um, relatively little impact, uh, noise or pollution or public health-wise on his community. Um, however, uh, it seemed like he was upset with the commissioner for not uh, treating Northern Metals with uh, red carpet and kid glove treatment um, in, the, uh, in the aftermath of a, a pretty calamitous event up there. And as they're looking at uh, gaining their, all their regulatory authorizations and permits, um, I'll let Senator Eaton, because Northern Metals' former facility is very close to her district. and. I'm sure the plume affected her community. Um, Northern Metals is one of the worst corporate actors and one of the worst polluters we've seen in the state of Minnesota um, ever. Uh, and you know has paid literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars in fines uh, for basically criminal violations of their responsibilities and obligations to keep the community in which they're situ situated uh, free from the harm of their operation. Uh, and uh, they have been shown to have um, you have a Excuse me, Senator Dibble, but do you have a question for the commissioner or, or a comment to the commissioner? A statement and a question, Madam Chair, which I think I should be allowed to do. Everyone else has been go, able to go on expository comments. Senator Weber laid a foundation, Senator Matthews, Senator uh, Ingebrigtsen. Uh, everyone has been able to lay a foundation for the points and the perspective that they bring to this conversation. I hope I'm allowed to do the same just because it's negative towards Business doesn't mean I should be interrupted. I'm not going to. Well, senator Dibble, I think you're being negative towards another senator where no one else has done that. And so I would just really appreciate it if you would, you know, uh, continue on, but but target your uh, comments towards uh, Commissioner Bishop and a question for her. Uh, Commissioner Bishop, um, I'm glad that you um, have shown such a willingness to be so flexible in working with so many businesses. Uh, uh, across the state. Um, you've shown that in your previous comments, um, and I think um, some of the written testimony that we've been the beneficiary of show that, that you've uh, created a, a great deal of flexibility and time, uh, and you've been very willing to go with and meet with um, even some of the worst and most egregious violators, uh, including Water Gremlin and others, to try to solve real problems, because that's, of course, in the interests of the health of the communities in which those companies are situated. Um, as well as uh, in the interest of the jobs uh, that those companies represent, um, the health of the employees uh, as well, and in the interest of our economy. We need to have uh, good, thriving businesses that also understand that they don't simply get to pollute our air and our water and our land for free and use, our, use them as their own free and open sewers that can violate our health. So I'm glad you have a business background, but I'm glad you also look out for the interests of, of um of the public and of the public's health and of, of, the, of the quality of our environment. You know, the Pollution Control Agency uh, is implied uh, in that name, uh, permits pollution, doesn't stop pollution. We have to accept a certain amount of pollution in all the activities that we undertake. And, and the idea, of course, is to make sure that that can be 
minimized uh, to the extent possible, including the pollution that affects um, climate change in the form of carbon dioxide and other uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah. Uh, a lot has been said about this being uh, a uh, performance review, but it really seems to be kind of a curated um, list of, of complaints and, and a, a long uh, effort to scold you for things that don't politically meet with the muster of the majority party. And I think that's a shame because I think you are to be commended and the governor's to be commended for bringing someone with your level of quality and experience and your interest in gaining the kind of input um, that's important from uh, the people of Minnesota. So I have a question about, um, you know, we hear a lot about the, you know, uh, clean cars um, uh, efforts. Um, you know, can, can you help us understand um, two things? One is, um, or oh, three things, you know. So everyone says this is a California standard, but this was going to be the national standard uh, until it was reversed by the Trump administration. If you could confirm if that's true or not. Uh, number two, um, can we hear a little bit about um, the contribution of the transportation sector uh, to climate change? And third, can you help us understand um, uh, going forward um, what the process is, uh, what the public process is uh, before Minnesota embarks on this change? Or, or, Bishop. or if, if we even decide to go embark on this change, because we're just at a point, a threshold of having decided to perhaps move forward with the process. And, and, a, and, a, and, a, and, and despite the fact that Senator Ingebrigtsen wants to um, uh, totally interrupt uh, the, the appropriation of, of the LCCMR dollars for important environmental projects, unless this gets dumped, um, we haven't even gotten to that point yet. So if you could help us understand what the process is. Senator Devil, I'm going to remind you that we are talking about uh, Commissioner Bishop, and, and I find many of your comments to be offensive. So please keep this, uh, this committee hearing to the standard that we have set in the Senate. Thank you. Commissioner Bishop. Thank you, uh, Senator Rood and Senator Dibble. Uh, so what I will say, first of all, I just want to address uh, the discussion about my business background and regulated parties, because there's been a lot of discussion, I think, from uh, and questions about how I'm treating regulated parties. And certainly um, that, those are fair questions. Uh, I will say that a big part of our work also is ingrained in getting uh, feedback from our communities. And this isn't just our regulated parties, but it's the citizens and um, our citizen groups were really instrumental in getting us information as well as uh, talking with them uh, with Water Gremlin, but also uh, in North Minneapolis with, with Northern Metals. So uh, citizens, I've consulted with every tribe in the state and will continue to do that. Uh, and I meet regularly with uh, environmental groups as well as our regulated parties. So I'm really looking at this from you know a bigger picture of how I make my decisions. Um, environmental justice is something that's important to the agency and important to the governor. And that is also something we're considering and uh, looking at and have an advisory group on environmental justice that uh, works closely with me as commissioner. What I will say on clean cars, is yes, the national standard is the national standard on the low emissions uh, vehicles uh, piece. That was the national standard until this recent rollback uh, by the Trump administration, the low emissions piece. There's a secondary part of our rulemaking, which is the zero emissions vehicles as well, which is you know 100 percent electric as well as some other vehicles, but really that um, has not been part of that national standard that we're also considering. Uh, there's a long process in this. Uh, we first started with a um, study that we did throughout this, uh, that we did in the state that uh, looked at uh, ways to decarbonize our transportation sector. And that was led in conjunction with MnDOT, Minnesota Department of Health and MPCA. And the findings in that were what drove us to issue this notice of intent for rulemaking. The notice of intent for rulemaking, it's been almost a year now since we put that out. We're getting a lot of input and feedback uh, from there. Then it's a proposed rule. Um, and again, that has a process that goes into any proposed rule that opens it up for comment. And before it gets to a final rule, uh, it would have to uh, meet muster with the uh, administrative law judge. 
And then after that, after uh, such a rule would be um, adopted, there is an automatic two-year delay that's under the Clean Air Act that gives manufacturers a two-year delay uh, before implementation. So we are a ways out. Um, even if this went forward in uh, calendar year 2021, it doesn't impact anything until cal uh, model year 2025 for any, any uh, cars coming into the state. I think there's also a myth out there, and um, I heard, uh, I think it was Senator Matthews say that, you know, controlling what uh, is sold on a dealer's lot. This does not control what's sold on a dealer's lot. It The um, requirements would be on manufacturers on what they bring into the state um, and a percentage of their fleets that they bring into the state. Uh, it doesn't dictate where those cars would be sold um, uh, in the state. And, you know, like other states, we're also looking at how uh, manufacturers get credit for some of the cars that they've sold in the past um, that meet these standards. So there's a system that we'll be looking at to make this um, work for uh, manufacturers, but also ensure that we're meeting the goals that uh, we seek to achieve, which would be uh, lowering greenhouse gas emissions, cleaning up the air, and providing a choice for consumers on these vehicles, which are in high demand. Thank you. Senator Dibble. Um, thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Commissioner Bishop. Thank you. Is there a follow up, Senator Dibble? Or? No, I think uh, okay. we have uh, Democrats who would like to ask questions, so I'd like to. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, next, Thanks, um, next hand up is um, Senator Herb. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, uh, Commissioner Bis Bishop, for your well responded. Um, answer to all the difficult questions and uh, for taking the time uh, and explain to everyone carefully. Um, I want to be short on my questions. And so, uh, as you know, uh, PFAB has been discovered in the East Metro um, and perhaps in other part of the state too. And I like, you know, your information on that, but uh, uh, Last year has been found and you know uh, identified in, in early this summer, and so um, I want to thank you for you know your leadership and your your accessibility and reaching out to city, county, and the communities, which is very very important to outreach and inform us, you know the uh, danger of this chemical that's left behind by you know, company or current land landfill. You know, so I, you know, want to take this opportunity to see if there's any update on the, the discovery of PFAP as a current, you know, and uh, Battle Creek is actually in my district, but I know that PFAP, you know, spread further than, uh, and discovered further than, you know, my district alone. Yes. Thank Mr. you. Bishop. Uh, Madam Chair and Senator Herr, thank you for that question. This is a troublesome chemical, uh, PFAS, and I think we, we're we seeing it uh, pop up in communities all throughout the state now, um, not just our East Metro. So as you know, and I know there was an item in the bonding bill that really looked at Bemidji and how uh, that, uh, the wells in Bemidji have also been uh, damaged through PFAS, and uh, that's a concern, uh, certainly is a concern. As far as the East Metro, um, we have been working very hard on trying to figure out uh, the proper way to address uh, the PFAS in the long term. We know that um, this is a tough one, and we only have so much in settlement uh, through the 3M settlement that to distribute. And so we want to look at priority for upgrading uh, wells as well as um, uh, addressing those community needs. And so it has been a very involved process, as you know, with engaging the city leaders, engaging the communities in those discussions. And we hope to have something this fall that will outline uh, those recommendations and decisions that we can bring forward on how to distribute those resources to address um, this issue. Uh, we've also, as you know, already distributed some of the funds to address it. As far as Battle Creek, um, 
yeah, we're concerned about this. There, uh, for the first time, we found PFAS foam in Battle Creek. And while uh, the drinking water is not uh, at stake right now in that area because um, it's provided, the, the drinking water is provided by St. Paul Regional Water System, um, that's not impacted by this. We're concerned that it would show up, in, that PFAS would show up in the creek. So we are doing an investigation of that, uh, working to determine what the impacts are um, on uh, the fish as well as on the water supply and find out where it's coming from. Um, that I think that's a really important piece. And PFAS impacts so many communities and things that we didn't uh, know until, you know, now we've started exploring it. Um, I talk a lot um, with Region 5 partners <laughs> about this growing issue. And uh, it's a, uh, it's appearing in all different areas of the country. Um, certainly, we don't want to see it here in our state, and uh, but we know that it's a reality. Uh, we see it in our organics material, which uh, when the leachate comes off of the organics material, which could be you know from food or food containers, that 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 has uh, PFAS in it as well. And we don't want that PFAS being spread on farms, spread on crops, and then getting into our food supply either. So. These are all real concerns that we have that we'd like to address. In fact, we did bring forward a proposal that would ask for uh, PFAS funding uh, through the LCCMR um, funding that would look at a research study. I think the request was for 2.3 million um, to be able to do further research on the biosolids piece and, and that leachate. So, um, we want to do more. Uh, we are applying for grants through the EPA. There are small grants, but really that look into that biosolids issue and we'll continue to do that research and continue to uh, involve those communities that we know are most impacted. Thank you for the question. Senator Herr. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for this response by uh, Commissioner Bishop. And uh, I'll, I'll look forward to uh, working with you this fall too. You know, I know that you always reach out to me when it's involving uh, the community of St. Paul and uh, you know our diverse community. And so, yeah, I'll be looking forward to work with you. I uh, recently I have the um, opportunity to uh, walk around uh, Battle Creek Lake, which is in Woodbury. You know, it's about I would say. Uh, close to 15 miles from the east side St. Paul. And, uh, you know, the, it's interesting to learn that, you know, things that um, affect Battle Creek Lake can flow all the way to the east side St. Paul and to Mississippi River. Uh, that's where the uh, PFAT is discovered. So I thank you for your response and I'll look forward to work with you uh, this fall. Thank you. Thank you. Um... And next up, we have the next hand raised is Senator Begum. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Commissioner Bishop, uh, you answered a lot of my questions regarding PFAS, but a couple things. I just want to first thank you because I think right after you were appointed um, and session uh, was uh, getting started, uh, you quickly met with me to discuss PFAS. Um, something that I've worked on and your um, assistant commissioner, Kurt Kadelka, have worked on since the early 2000s. So I think that um, shows the importance to this issue to the East Metro, but throughout the state. And yeah. so I want to thank you for that. Um, I, it was before you got there, but the $850 million um, settlement, um, your staff also helped uh, under the previous administration make sure that that money is protected and can't be used for for other things and that it's going to help clean up uh, this pollution. So um, I appreciate that. And I also think, you know, I don't think, and I know you wouldn't argue with this, there's no process that's perfect, right? Especially when there's no blueprint for a lot of this stuff. But um, I really feel that um, the expedited projects and the grant money that came along with that most recently, uh, right in my backyard, if I open this up and we went down a block, that is literally where um, well water is now being connected to municipal water and most residents uh, are receiving municipal uh, water, which has been treated um, and all paid for the settlement. So um, I know that um, the expedited uh, projects have been helpful. 
Um, I'm disappointed about LCCMR bill not coming through. You already mentioned that. I was going to ask you about that, about the project um, in there for PFAS. So I will just pass on that because I think you've addressed that. I also want to um, uh, ask, and then I, I have a separate question from PFAS, but I wanted to ask um, what are we, PFAS is across the, well, it's across the globe, but in, in the United States, there's many states that are, taking action and, you know, just kind of dealing with this in their own way. I'm wondering, what are we doing from your department's perspective um, to kind of work with the other states and agencies? The, the um, EPA uh, also has a, a big um, role in this, but I'm just wondering if you can maybe elaborate on that partnership and just kind of like how you're collaborating. Sure. Commissioner Bishop. Great, Madam Chair and Senator Bigham. So certainly, so thank you for those comments and that question. We have a real, whether it's um, an association of various states that we work with where we learn um, and have working groups on PFAS um, where we're learning from or through our region five commissioners. Um, in addition, EPA is working with us on this. They have a whole um, research and development arm that is looking at this and like I said we're we've applied for one grant it's a small grant but really looking at the biofuel or bio uh, solids issues uh, with them uh, so those are regular discussions um, I know that you mentioned assistant commissioner Kadelka he uh, is very involved in those groups so he and uh, the Department of Health go together um, on those groups to really compare notes. We know that uh, finding the regulated parties and holding regulated parties are an important part of, part of this process because it is expensive on the cleanup. And the settlement that uh, we got here in Minnesota, this was before my time, of course, um, it's one of the largest. Um, so we have a lot of agencies um, throughout and state um, agencies that come to us to ask what went into that process, how did that work, um, so that uh, they also, when they're looking at um, their uh, lawsuits and other uh, settlements that they're figuring in and learning from our experience, because we really are on kind of the leading side of this right now. Senator Bigham. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I also um, think it's important to point out that the transparency from the settlement, there's a new web, there's a website, it's been on for over almost two years now about um, all the projects that are going on and the transparency on that. And I think that that's helpful too. Um, right. One other thing um, I just wanted to highlight um, was the work on Water Gremlin. That was a, a, a big deal. It was a, a corporation that was including the community and their workers. And you came in very, you and your staff came in very swiftly and took, um, took he you know, took care of that and are working with them. And I appreciate that. It is not um, an easy task that you have, but I think, um, and this is going to go into my my final thing. I think these um, committees, uh, inf informational committees, um, you know, are about the qualifications of the commissioner. And I think also about meetings and meeting objection and goals. And I appreciate Senator Senjum's questions uh, regarding that. And, and that's why when there are concerns or complaints about letters, um, you know, your determinations are based on science and they're based on data. And so I don't worry about that. And, and in our line of work, Commissioner, you know, we, uh, I've been, I'm old enough to remember <laughs> when governors send letters to chairs saying, I have problems with these provisions in your bill. And I'm, I, I know that there uh, are situations where majority leaders may um, quickly after removing a, a commissioner uh, announce that they're going to be looking at other commissioners and then chairs call hearings and um, they start uh, doing uh, reviews and um, or that you're not going to pass a certain LCCMR bill and then if you don't drop another provision. Those are things that are concerning because that's politics, not about the qualifications. And if that was the case, uh, Commissioner, your qualifications are impeccable and um, appreciate um, bringing in private sector business um, and that you stepped away from a job that dealt with sustainability 
um, to, to help bring that innovation to the state of Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Bingham, was there a question? No, that was my comment about um, the objective and goals and qualifications of commissioners. Okay. And that's what these should be about, not about politics and disagreeing. Thank you. Next, Thank you. Uh, Senator Hall. Well, thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioner Bishop. Thanks for being here. I've, uh, in, a, in my previous life, I've got a long history with the MPCA as a fire marshal. I worked with uh, with spills not only in the Mississippi but also with uh, with underground storage tanks and those leaking and the recovery from that. So I've got a long history with the MPCA. I've got three questions, uh, very different on three different topics. So. Uh, the first one I'm going to tackle is got my pen ready. There you go. Okay. Uh, it, it's about landfill. It's about, it's about the Sartell landfill on Lagoon Three. The MPCA moved to extend the post closure care for Lagoon Three for 30 years. This landfill has just completing a 30 year post closure, and this is going to be extremely costly for the city of Sartell. The city of Sartell and SPX Corporation requested a, con a contested hearing, a contested case hearing, and requested a five-year extension for Part B. I guess w when I reviewed that, that piece, I was concerned that we had one thing that flagged up towards the end, which was something that it's one of the pieces that's looked at in the wells, but it, it was one that was up stream from the site it was just a, uh, a, a small smidgen and it's something that's naturally found in that area i was wondering why and i'm not looking for an answer to that specific thing because i don't ex expect you to know every every action on every landfill but as a policy in 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 your guidance to the to your staff when you've got something that's that's looks like it's nearing the end of the review cycle. Why wouldn't a five-year look at that? Why why do we take this to court? Why can't we we come to a negotiated settlement on some of these things instead of always looking to the courts to to do that? Mm -hmm. Commissioner Bishop. So um thank you, Madam Chair and uh Senator Howe. So I We'll look into that more. I'm really, I'm very aware of the situation there and Anne Sartell and the concerns uh, with that landfill and uh, some of the uh, leaching that that landfill is uh, doing and contamination. So we need to, I think we agree that there's something that needs to be happening there. Um, what I will say is the, the discussions are still ongoing uh, from what I know with the city and SPX. So. Um, those are discussions that we'll continue to have uh, with them. And I don't know that we're to that, to that point of a lawsuit yet, but maybe you know a little bit more uh, on that than I do right now. But I'll, I'll look into it and get back to you. I don't like to settle these things through the courts. Certainly a contested case hearing is to allow for more input into the permit and uh, process. I don't see that as a court piece as uh, with the administrative law judge really mediating. Um, I think that's a good process to be able to really get the best information in these permits. Um, but again, courts play a role here, but if we can come to agreements that are within the law, those uh, are of interest to me as well. Well, and I, and I know, thank you, Madam Chair, and I know that there's multiple, uh, I think city of Sartell's got a couple of different landfill issues out there. Okay. One went to court, one did not. So one is, and I don't know what the, what the result of this uh, contested case hearing request is. I just was looking more of a philosophical look at, at how we go forward with this. So I was, uh, the next thing I'd like to know, you know, with the, uh, with the deal with the, with the, uh, proposed rule on vehicles and, and you know, I, I just want to, I couldn't find the vehicle I wanted in the state of Minnesota. I went to a dealer looking for a used one, couldn't find what I wanted, ended up 
uh, get ordering a new one, right? And we found it not in the state of Minnesota. It was out state. It was shipped in like anyone else can go get a, you know, they can, if they can't find the vehicle on any lots, you, you can go to any dealership that's, and you can search Minnesota for, and you can shirt, search anywhere in the country for that manufacturer, they'll find that vehicle for you. So that's what I did. And they had it shipped in. How will the proposed rule affect transactions like that? Mm -hmm. Commissioner. So Madam Chair and Senator Howe, um, certainly there are um, vehicles that aren't available in the state and part of uh, this rule is to address some of that. Um, I will assume that the vehicle that you were um, trying to get into the state um, was not a low emissions or um, zero emissions vehicle under these clean car um, not even propose a discussion. Um, but uh, those vehicles that come into the state um, do have to meet the standards uh, that um, would be there. And again, those standards, the low emission standards are the nationwide standard right now. And many of the manufacturers um, are deciding if they are going to um, continue to meet those low emission standards or make different cars um, per different state. So again, the national standard has been that low emissions. So you shouldn't have a problem with that car um, coming into the state, uh, assuming that those uh, companies aren't deciding to um, change their uh, development of their cars. Um, what we have found too is uh, like you are saying is that a lot of people want uh, low emissions or these zero emissions and electric cars uh, in the state of Minnesota as well. And they have challenges in getting those cars right now. And um, it is a hope that uh, this rule would bring in more choice for consumers in that space. Right now, uh, there's about 40 cars available in the U.S. Um, uh, that meet these standards yet um, that's today, right? And again, these wouldn't affect till calendar year model 2025. And we know that many of the manufacturers are going in that direction, um, but uh, that are having trouble finding, in Minnesota, there's only about 21. Uh, in Europe, when you go there, there's 150 models of cars right now that meet the low emissions or zero emissions standard. And by 2025, they expect 450 models. So um, just in looking at kind of where that's going and that consumer choice piece, I think is important as well when uh, consumers in Minnesota really would like to look at ways to buy an electric vehicle or a low emissions vehicle. Thank you. Senator Hall. Oh, Senator Hall. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you for that answer, Commissioner Bishop. But so it really won't, uh, from what I take from that, you're telling me it won't change what I could do today to go buy a vehicle that doesn't exist in Minnesota. I can get that anytime, anywhere, as long as, but what I'm, what I'm concerned about there is that if we change our emission standards, other than what this can, national is, I may run into a problem if I choose to do that in the future on a certain vehicle, if it doesn't, but even if I wanted a, zero emissions vehicle today and it wasn't available in Minnesota, I could still go to whatever dealer, Toyota, GM, Ford, and order that from another state and not have a problem getting it in here just like it would be today. As, so, yeah, Senator Rood and Senator Howe, as long as that um, manufacturer has that supply and that's been a challenge with 14 states, um, the cars go to those states that have these standards and regulations. So um, that is something that, of course, you know, when we see this, that Minnesotans are interested in cleaner vehicles and uh, the supply goes to uh, areas that um, of the country where these standards are in place. Senator Hall. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, I'll leave that as may. I, you know, with half the uh, cars on the market, uh, ha half the car manufacturers in the market doing it, I, I, I think the market driven will will make that happen without this rulemaking. But I'd like to go on since since we've had the virus come in, uh, we've seen, and because we shut down except for takeout on a lot of restaurants. Uh, they shifted to containers and bags. Now, before we had the virus and before we shut down a lot of bars and restaurants, most of our, there was a big deal getting rid of the plastic bags. There was a big deal getting rid of the styrofoam containers. Now I see them almost exclusively being used everywhere because nobody wants the reusable bags brought into the facilities. They, uh, and so we end up with a lot of that. What are we doing? Or, it, was there a change in the recycle process or are we, how are we going to handle this in the future? Uh, I guess, yeah. you know, what, what is the MPCA doing to, to, to respond to that? Commissioner yeah. Bishop. Thank you. Uh, Chair Rood and uh, Senator Howe, thank you for that question. Um, certainly we are seeing an uptick in uh, waste and so um, I was really pleased that we could work with Senator Ingebrigtsen on some of the um, solid waste tax issues uh, just this last uh, session because uh, during COVID where there was some discussion about kind of separating waste and other pieces, um, it became a, a problem for some of these uh, waste, um, solid waste administrators and especially our counties. So we've looked at ways to address that. Um, we want more recyclables and that sorting process is important. We've seen a lot of investments by um, our counties in uh, recycling organics and that will just need to continue. But um, we also know that we have a hierarchy of uh, waste here in the state and adding more landfills takes a lot of consideration um, on how we go to do that. It's really kind of the last thing that uh, we want to do. We want to, you know, discourage uh, as much waste as possible. And certainly we see that, you know, these one-time containers become pretty prevalent during COVID, uh, unfortunately. So that increases some of our waste. Um, but, you know, that discouraging that uh, waste, and then we look at everything else from recycling to waste to energy and you know, lastly on landfills. So that is something that we're working and managing through right now on how we can um, address this larger problem going forward. And also to determine if there's certificate of need that is necessary for um, additional landfills, uh, not just to COVID, but to our waste in general. It's, it's, it's troublesome. It's, it's funny because we go to um, I was in um, Sweden and I was an exchange student way back in 1988 in Sweden for a year. And um, I go back there once in a while, but their idea of landfilling is just non-existent. You know, they do everything from recycling to waste to energy, but it, visiting a landfill, things that are buried are buried and known in these landfills of where they are because at some point they hope that they can reuse or turn that into something different. And uh, that whether it's glass or sheetrock or something into a different product. And I think that's a model that we'd like to see. Um, this committee really worked to pass um, funding for recycling markets and to really look at that development. So turning recyclables into products. And we see so many great companies kind of popping up in Minnesota where they're taking milk cartons and making furniture and uh, decking and siding or other um, products that we see in the state. And that's the method that we'd like to continue on a path to encourage. Senator Howe. Well, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Commissioner Bishop. I hope that uh, you find ways to incentivize that uh, yes. uh, that process. And, and because I do know there's a plastics recycler that would love to do uh, the grocery bags, the plastic groceries bags, but that is fearful of the multi-million dollar investment because they're fearful more, they're fearful that more 
cities will ban the plastic bags so they can, will not have a steady flow of product to be able to, to do that. So we need to look at all sources, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next hand up is Senator Carlson. But Senator Carlson, did I see someone else tried to join us on your uh, video cam there a minute ago? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, that it, uh, uh, that is my boss around here now. It's a it's a new cat, and uh, he has he has no boundaries. <laughs> <laughs> no filter yet. Huh? <laughs> All right, Senator Senator Carlson. Uh, thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, you know, I guess I see we're getting closer to 12 o'clock here. And so I'm going to try to talk fast and also not ask a lot of questions. Uh, I do have, and I'm actually going to reverse my uh, my agenda here, and I'm going to ask my question first and uh, have uh, the uh, commissioner uh, see if uh, maybe they can, uh, she can uh, give me a little bit of comfort. And it's kind of the same question as Senator Hall had about some of the things that we do not recycle right now or do not have a plan to. And yeah. Senator Hall, I think uh, this uh, guarantee of plastic bags, I think I can help with that because my garage is now packed with <laughs> probably more than a year's worth of plastic bags that can be recycled. Uh, I also do wanna make sure that we do something for our campaign signs because the vinyl that's used in them is not uh, um, approved for recycling. So we need to do some of those things. That's, you know, I'm getting a lot of pressure from my constituents to add things to recycling, like mattresses, like the plastic bags, like the, the campaign signs. So I wanna see if there's something that uh, the commissioner has run across where we can be more recycling um, savvy. Yeah. Commissioner Bishop. So Senator, uh... Brood and Senator Carlson, thank you. Uh, we have a working group uh, that is always uh, here at the agency that really looks at recycling um, and different uh, ability for recycling. So I think we're finding that, you know, some of the glass that can go into the roadways, um, we've worked with MnDOT on a couple different uh, different projects that I think are really interesting, but, you know, for the, or, or old tires, uh, when I visited Liberty Tire to really look at how they were using and reusing that. Um, I think there's a lot of really interesting approaches that we can look at in the state. Um, there's, like I talked about, the milk cartons into furniture. There's a great company up there in Duluth called Lowell, which makes uh, more modern furniture that is uh, all out of milk cartons and it's really popular all over the world uh, now. And so I think that there's some really innovative things that we can do and certainly working with our recycling community. They don't want things on their lot that don't have some value to them either. So figuring out that that uh, way to make uh, those recyclables valuable is uh, part of our incentive in creating this kind of market development approach to really help with some grants to get some of this started. Senator Carlson. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair and, and Commissioner. Uh, next, I'd like to just give a, a little bit of a shout out of all of the things that uh, I have come in contact with where I am very impressed with what the agency has done. One of the biggest things that is, and I'll, I'll maybe I'll preface it with, there are a lot of projects that have different perspectives. And it's up to the MPCA sometimes to help us, gu help guide us to the right direction and sometimes even refuse to go certain directions. Sure. And one of those is the freeway landfill. And we have worked, I have been working with Burnsville for some time. I've met with the landowner a long time ago and we have a real problem there. And Senator Rude knows about it as well because she, was on a bill that we actually uh, passed to help with the taking of the land if the um, landowner is not being responsive or not being cooperative. And this landowner has that reputation. Now we're faced with something that no one likes, and that is taking someone's land. 
uh, this fellow is very litigious and he has, uh, he has sued everyone, including his own family. Uh, and there's been, um, you know, there, we're getting close to the drop dead date where we have to do something so that we do not flood this landfill with groundwater and then it leaches into the Minnesota River. And this is a landfill that we're all going to be looking at that are in future sessions because it is a massive amount of money that is gonna to take to be able to fix this. So I wanna say, um, you know, I, I know that this is a real problem for everyone that's been involved with this project because there's no good solutions. There's no cheap solution. There's nothing that is going to make everyone happy. So by the time we're done with this, there's going to be some people that are very angry. They'll probably lose lawsuits. Uh, we have gone through many of these things already. And I think uh, Senator Rood remembers when we had a, uh, a letter that came from the, Fed, the feds saying, it's gonna cost $75 million. Just tell us how much you're going to contribute. And we tried to figure out an alternative and the MPCA did take on that project. And I really thank you for that because that's all, okay. been the only thing that's kept everybody out of court. So thank you for that. Um, you. And you know, I wanna say that, uh, um, uh, go back to, and you know, and I, I put my hand up about an hour and a half ago, uh, and I wanted to answer something that, uh, that really did bother me. And that is that when we're talking about the performance, of, uh, the performance appraisal, I've worked in two Fortune 500 companies. One of them is probably a Fortune 100. And we had, a, I've done a lot of performance appraisals and I've had a lot of them done on me. And when you have, and in fact, if anybody is in a large corporation now, you write your own performance appraisal and you get your own um, letters of support. You uh, generally do a lot of that work yourself. And in this particular case, no matter what we say, this, and you can look at the agenda right now, and it still says right now, this minute, it says reviewing the job performance of Minnesota Pollution Control Agency Commissioner Laura Bishop. That's a performance appraisal. And the, the criticism of getting letters of support is just, that is, to me, it's, it's, it's not recognizing what a performance appraisal is. And you have gotten these letters of support. The people have signed them. They are they're adults. They know what they're signing. And, and in fact, if I wanted to say something a little bit on the, on the other side is I've gotten lots of support words from people who have worked with you and work, worked with the staff, all levels of the staff. And now we have these uh, letters of support that the committee all has, but I don't have any negative letters. I didn't get any that were shared from other members of the committee. And so as far as I'm concerned, the performance appraisal that I am reviewing right now is all positive. So I appreciate your work. And I think that um, I'm looking forward to working on more of these things, especially the recycling and the freeway landfill. Some of them will be more fun than others, but I appreciate your work. I appreciate your being here and coming to this, uh, to this hearing. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Carson. Next up, we have uh, Senator Curran. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you, Commissioner Pashon. Um, my questions and comments are related to the, uh, of course, the, the emission standards. And I think Senator Howe covered a couple of those uh, statements about the, in your own words, 50% of the cars on the road today currently meet the low emission standards, and that the review, and so the capitalism appears to be working um, and people are the building better cars, building cleaner cars, and we're all happy about that. And people who have a choice where they can get them. The other part, and I appreciate you finally linking to, um, instead of just using the term zero emission, it's really talking about how do you mandate electric vehicles in Minnesota? And, and I just, frankly, I'm challenged that we're removing um, the citizen input. I know we have a very, I know you, you described the public process and the rulemaking processes very well known by all those in the political arena. A lot of citizens have no idea, don't track that process in which you're essentially writing law outside of the legislative process. And I think the average citizen knows that 
um, they have representation. That's us, the legislative body. You indicated two, only two states have utilized the legislature. Um, I think in this particular case that it's very, um, uh, it's a significant move. I don't, I, I know you also mentioned, I think we had a couple people testify that, you know, you just can't get a vehicle. Uh, frankly, um, I, most people can get every vehicle they want, even if it's a low, low use vehicle um, from anywhere in the country. And so that process is moving along. So I think I'm not quite sure why we're even going through this particular process, because ultimately what it will do is come to the point where we will mandate an electronic vehicle, a uh, percentage of electronic vehicles available in Minnesota. There will be a penalty as described by your staff if that is not determined. I, I'm troubled with it because of the couple things is that one that manufacturer then has to report every vehicle and style and type of vehicle that's reported or sold in the state. It's frankly none of government's business. That, that, those types of records aren't even included in a, in a tax filing, which is probably the most invasive reporting that we have to the state. So I think, I, I think with the electronic, electric car mandates in which you're actually exploring, the public process is not a very public process. And, and I don't think the governor has minced his words, and I know you guys um, represent, and I know are working on his needs. He hasn't said we're going to implement this or we're going to go through this process to see if we're going to implement it. He says we're going through this process to implement it. He doesn't mince words on that. So, so on that, all I do is it, you know just kind of argue that it is really the legislature's responsibility. And I know every, your description is very detailed and, and very good and, and that it has a public element to it. Unfortunately, most of the public's out working and not paying attention to the inner workings of the government. They expect us, their legislators and elected officials to be able to, to represent their role. Um, the question I have for you is, um, you talked about some of the VW money moving on to the electric school bus pilot. Not sure why we need a pilot today. And I'd like to understand um, Metro Transit has already gone through and purchased eight buses today or in the, in the last year at a cost of three times the, that of a standard bus. Um, what have you learned from their pilot and their foray into being able to support um, the infrastructure support that was necessary? And did those buses meet their intended goals? Sure. Senator, or Commissioner Bishop, so did we knock you off your chair already? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Have we had a chair? I don't know if uh, Zoom. I don't know if I get this work. <laughs> Commissioner, you're gonna have a tough. You're gonna have a tough time getting a workers' comp claim on a Zoom meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, uh, Commissioner Bishop. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so. Um, <laughs> The uh, questions, you know, about uh, clean cars, certainly we are going through this process. So you talked about uh, the manufacturers kind of must report. Those are all pieces that would come out in a proposed rule to get feedback on. So again, we want citizen engagement. We want citizens involved and uh, that there will be a large component of that. So um, we are hearing a lot from people now, um, even though those comment periods aren't open. So it is our intention to continue that um, on the electric, uh, the zero emissions and low emissions vehicles. So thank you for that. You, because you threw me off my chair, you have to remind me what that second part of your question was because uh, I started laughing and now I forgot. And, you know, I think I'm sorry, two hours into it, this meeting. It, it, it was a pretty simple question. So, um, <laughs> but it, it, it was around your statement that we're going to put money into a pilot for electric school buses sure. in it. I think Got it was it. some of the VW money. And yeah. and I'm Got not it. sure why we need a not sure why we need a pilot when Metro Transit has already engaged. They've had those electric buses for a year, and I think that that information would be interesting. Um, one, if you would share the results of that, and then why we would move into this electric school bus pilot. Sure. Sorry, Commissioner Senator, Bishop. Uh, yeah, Madam Chair and Senator Hall or Senator Corrin, thank you so much for repeating yourself. Um, 
So certainly we learned from Metro Transit. I think the, the piece that we have to remember, it's Metro Transit. So their bus routes are you know, very local. So when we're looking at this, um, we want to go to different regions of the state and um, potentially out to greater Minnesota as well. And so we know that the range on some of these buses and especially um, can be 100 miles. They're heavy uh, vehicles. But we also want to put them in areas where um, we have notable need of improvement in the air quality. So we're looking at all of that. Um, but we will compare with the Metro Transit results and I can try to follow up on that and how our staff has done that. Um, but you know what we're going to do and why we're calling it a pilot project is they are expensive. So we want to put and make sure that the investment is a good one. So we will okay. have data and analysis that we'll be doing about these buses on the energy savings, on gas savings, on how their routes are working, on how the charging is working before we would go uh, further out with any of these buses. So I think it's a really interesting way to pilot this. We know that there's only one school bus right now in Minnesota and that's through um, Lakeville Schools and Schmidt and Sons. And we also know that, you know, it's reliable, hardly um, into uh, needing maintenance and that the kids love it. They're so disappointed when that bus, that quiet bus doesn't show up uh, to take them to school and something else does. So I think that it's really interesting to start this pilot project. Um, and again, not just Metro, but looking uh, throughout uh, in, in, greater, in areas in greater Minnesota as well. Senator Grant. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I, I would argue otherwise. I think Metro Transit already has a, a great, uh, interesting pilot. They have short Metro routes, um, but we, they think they failed mass. Those buses are on the road for 16 hours a day. And in many cases, the school buses that utilize that are out there, unless they're school owned, um, and then they likely can't afford them because of the tremendous cost. And I think what people just don't understand is the infrastructure is not available. Metro Transit didn't even have enough power in the building to store eight of those or to power and install the chargers for those uh, eight buses, more or less the infrastructure to recharge them in route. Um, and so I think there's so much to be learned from that. It's already in place. It's far more dynamic than we'll get out of a couple school pilots all over the world or all over the state. And so I would argue that money should be used and, and likely put somewhere else. Um, but it would be great, great to see a comparison. And then to uh, highlight, I believe Metro has installed two generators um, to actually be able to power those electric charging stations. So um, I would hope our schools if they go through that, actually have enough power and who's gonna pay for that increased cost of the infrastructure within those schools. So Thank you. I, would love, I would love the comparison. Thank you. Great, thanks. Members, we have two senators who still have their hands up and then we will, um, we will close after that. Okay. So um, uh, Senator Swazinski, you have been very patient and it's your turn, you're up. Thank you, Madam Chair and I there I go again. The chair as well. <laughs> um, I just want to thank you for indulging um, us past this uh, allotted time, Madam Chair. Um, thank, thank you, me. Commissioner, for coming in and preparing for today. I've gone through your letters of support and resume, and honestly, I, I don't know if there's a more qualified candidate in the state of Minnesota besides you. I, I think we'd all be hard-pressed to find that person out there. So. I, I appreciate your professionalism, um, your pre preparedness for today. Uh, I've just been very impressed. Um, I found it very mm -hmm. enlightening and informative. And I, uh, I, I, I appreciate all my colleagues' comments and questions um, that I found so um, um, important for us to discuss here. My okay. only question, I just want to, well, first of all, you have the hardest job in the state of Minnesota. I really believe that because the balancing act between um, preservation of the environment and economic growth and opportunity is the toughest balance government has to has to do. And I really appreciated Senator Senjum's um, question about rulemaking and lawmaking. But my only question for you is, it, with respect to, uh, uh, we've talked a lot today about the past performance. I'd like to know if you had magic dust and could do one thing <laughs> 
in um, the next two years that you could leave Minnesota better than you found it? What, what would you do with that opportunity? Uh, Thank Commissioner you. Bishop, it better include sharing your magic dust with me, okay? Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, thank and you. Heading up to her district. <laughs> well, it's funny. So, uh, Chairman Rude and Senator Swazinski, so thank you. It's, it's funny because I split my time up and between your two districts. I have a, our, we have a family cabin that's been in our family for over 50 years. That's in Aiken. So, uh, that covers uh, Senator Rood's district. And then of course my home being in your district in Eden Prairie. So I go between the two uh, regularly, which is kind of fun. So um, magic dust. I mean, certainly what I think we all want is uh, our waters and our air to be clean here in Minnesota. So for me, um, a priority has been uh, staying ahead of this as well as uh, cleaning it up. We know that um, it's much harder when we have to clean something up than if we can prevent it. And so uh, my magic dust would be to act more on uh, prevention uh, and resiliency, which I think is a really important piece. And we see that uh, uh, along our Great Lakes uh, in responding to uh, climate change and how we're seeing those rising waters. So I think staying ahead of this and staying in front, um, my magic dust would be investing more in our resiliency and investing more in prevention so that we can protect our, our um, great state and the environment that we all wanna protect. So thank you. Senator. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was done. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Senator. Thank you. Uh, and last but not least, uh, Senator Torres Ray. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair. I I had uh, some questions that I just think will take too long to go over, uh, but I want to say thank you, uh, um, Commissioner. I very much hope that in the future, our committees have a structure that really focus on what commissioners do and, and the responsibility over the organization. Um, I know that we have differences of opinion about many of these projects. We have different experiences, we do represent different districts and we disagree on how you should pursue certain issues. I understand that, but these hearings are not for that. We have plenty of opportunities to call a hearing for every single project and go deeply into this. And the staff that you hire, Commissioner, are experts on that. And they will give us, you know, uh, full revisions of, of what is happening nation worldwide. And we engage in this process uh, today. And unfortunately, we just couldn't go deeper into that. So I really appreciate your graciousness and patience. <laughs> Thank you. What I really wanted to hear today was, um, you know, about the future of the agency, how you want to handle the deficit. I disagree with this notion that we have to cut agencies across, you know, three, four, five percent to address the deficit. I would like to hear more about your vision for the future, knowing that we will be under a deficit. I am also very concerned about the fact that there are a lot of people who are retiring in different state organizations, including yours, and yes. that it is very hard to replace these people because we don't pay the salaries that they are getting paid in the private sector, including you, that it is a sacrifice to work in public sector, not only because we don't pay well, but because you are asked to do work that goes above and beyond your responsibilities. I am concerned about the fact that we don't have enough funding, and I experienced this with uh, Minneapolis Reconstruction, to really deal with business services, with the, 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 the work that you need to do in the organization to support businesses yeah. in business services. I have mm -hmm. asked the staff to help us, and they've done an amazing work to help us understand how do we get permits, what do they need to do, and Consumer affairs is underfunded. The regulatory division is underfunded. So I am very concerned about all of these issues and I wish we have had a hearing that really addresses 
all of these things that we need to do as legislators to make sure that you do your job the way you are supposed to. Unfortunately, I don't have the time to ask you those questions. And I hope we have a future opportunity, uh, Madam Chair and members, to focus our conversations in these hearings about these very critical issues. Yeah. We have to do this because I need to hear from the commissioner about her plan for the next few years. Yeah. And I, I just didn't get to hear that. So I, it's not the time. I hope you are able to say something like this in your closing remarks, but mm -hmm. I just hope that we structure these hearings in a different way. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, members. Thank you. Thank you. And members, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Senator Ingebretson for, uh, he has, um, Senator Thomasoni had to get off the call. He has one statement that he'd like to read. Senator Ingebretson. Thank you, uh, members. And Senator Thomasoni did send me this message. He had to leave for another meeting. Uh, he states okay. on chat, and you probably all have it, but Commissioner, you may not. Since I yeah, thank you. Since I have another urgent meeting and have already missed a meeting. That I, I'm sorry. That's good. Am I coming through? Yes, you are. Yeah. He just wanted to make a comment that he, he had a previous meetings here. I want to thank the commissioner for her defense of the polymet permit, and I look forward to working with the agency and the commissioner in the future. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, um, Commissioner Bishop, would you like to do a closing statement? We'd love to hear from you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Rood, and thank you, Chair Ingebrigtsen, and all members of the committee. I, I very much appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Uh, certainly, um, I should be expected to defend my work as commissioner and to talk about areas where I think we can improve. And I think you hit it, or you hit on that today, uh, some as well as uh, areas that are working. So I hope that we can continue to have an open dialogue there. Senator Senjum had asked me about, you know, values that I bring into this role. And that one uh, that I brought out, uh, learn from challenge and change. I accepted this job knowing it would be a big challenge and that there are challenges facing our state um, and with our environment. And so I gladly accepted that and uh, I expect uh, to be challenged every day. Otherwise I wouldn't have taken this job and I'd probably be bored. So I like that uh, we are uh, continuing these dialogues and you have my word that I will continue to listen and learn and act um, in this role as commissioner. And I look forward to continuing to work with you and the communities throughout the state um, to do my best to exceed your expectations and to um, that you have for me, that your constituents have for me and the governor has for me. And I recognize and respect your role uh, as senators and your role in this confirmation process and I humbly ask that you would recommend me for confirmation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Chair Ingebretson, do you have a comment before we close? No, I just want to thank uh, thank you, Senator Rood, for uh, calling this this uh, this meeting and inviting us along with you. <clears throat> uh, you. A lot of our members uh, sit on both committees, but some do not. <clears throat> but thank you again, Commissioner, uh, and other members for being here and uh, going through uh, what we think are some uh, some cont cont uh, contentious issues. Uh, uh, some of them are are mechanical in in, in nature, and yes, uh, some are political in nature. We all are here. We sit as all politicians, and and we we kind of throw that. Okay. political name that political word around when we want to use it for a plus or a minus but the bottom line is you're in a political position you represent a uh, represent the governor that puts you there and and uh, we certainly appreciate you coming here and and answering for uh, for his his uh, policies and and uh, uh, look forward sure. to, um, to uh, working with you in the future thank you again thank you senator and uh, I also thank you, Commissioner, for coming today. Um, we had some frank conversations. It's not always easy to be under fire, but I appreciate the frank conversations. You know, during COVID, we've really a lot lost a lot of connectivity. 
um, a lot of the issues that we would be at the legislature discussing and you, you know testifying to and having committee hearings and we lost that this year and so um, we have a lot of things to uh, talk about and to discuss uh, going forward. I hope we are able to do that in January, that we can uh, have some good face-to-face -face meetings. Um, I, I heard you um, really commit to some good communication issues, and I hope we can look forward to that. I want to thank this for committee, this committee, because you've already been, you've been very patient uh, in, in going over time to let everyone speak. And so uh, with that, uh, thank you and have a, a, a good afternoon. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks.